Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, Spring Hill family, and friends. I'm Pastor E. Tremaine Solomon, and I welcome you to Spring Hill Baptist Church Fall Virtual Revival. If you don't mind, take a moment and like and share this broadcast. Share it with your family and your friends as we prepare to worship the Lord tonight in spirit and in truth. I know that we've been in the sanctuary in a hybrid fashion since April, but I didn't think it was quite time for us to gather for revival just yet. And one of the things that we've learned in this global health pandemic is that God has provided with us means and resources to reach the world and to gather safely in a virtual fashion. So that's what we're doing tonight. We're worshiping revival in a virtual fashion tonight. Also, we're still on a high here at the Spring Hill Church from celebrating our 181st church anniversary. Give God a hand clap of praise for that. But not only did we celebrate 181 years of God's faithfulness, but we also celebrated the paying off of our church's mortgage in full in the midst of a pandemic. Give God praise for that. And tonight is just a continuation of our celebration tonight as we come to gather for revival. We're blessed tonight by a dynamic speaker, a dynamic man of God who's no stranger to us in the person of my friend, my mentor in life and ministry, beloved brother, Reverend Frank Kennedy Jr., who is the executive pastor of the New Mount Island Church down in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, where he's doing a great work with another dear friend of mine, Dr. Marcus Davis, who's the senior pastor. And so tonight, uh, I want you to prepare your hearts and your minds to hear from on high as he mounts the virtual pulpit tonight. But before we do that, I want to encourage you to sow a seed into the Spring Hill Church. Our giving platforms are probably coming across the screen. You can sow a seed of any size that you would like. Spring Hill, we ask that each member sow a $10 seed. You can give that through Givelify, through Cash App, and by mail tonight. Uh, as we prepare, as you prepare your gifts tonight, let us pause for a word of prayer. Eternal God, we say thank you tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to gather in this virtual space. God, we are coming heavy hearted and heavy burdened. Many people have different issues that they're dealing with tonight, God, but we come casting our care upon you tonight because you care for us. We pray now for the man who will stand in John's shoes and preach the gospel to us tonight. God, we pray that you would give him the words, give him the courage and the boldness to speak life into us, oh God, and to share your word. God, we pray for the singing that will take place. We pray for every person that's tuned in virtually. Every household is represented tonight. And we pray, God, that we will be empowered and enlightened, equipped and edified. Bless those who will sow into the work of the Spring Hill Church. And God, we pray now and thank you for their gifts in advance. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare now, prepare your hearts to hear from our praise team as they lead us into the presence of God. And then the next voice you will hear be that of our guest evangelist, Pastor Frank Kennedy Jr. If we were in the sanctuary at Spring Hill, I would have you to lift your right hand toward Pastor Kennedy. And so lift your right hand toward the screen tonight or the telephone tonight or the computer screen tonight and say, Pastor Kennedy, preach God's word. Pastor Kennedy, preach God's word. Pastor Kennedy, be guilty of preaching God's word. And I believe in this praying in the homes, praying in the pews, They'll be preaching in the virtual pulpit. God bless you. Good evening, Spring Hill. Welcome to Revival. <laughs>
Well, bless the Lord, and indeed, it is a profound delight, and uh, I am so overjoyed, indeed, overwhelmed to have this auspicious privilege to share with Pastor Solomon and the Spring Hill Baptist Church of Lineville, Alabama. Pastor uh, Solomon, I give deference to you, sir, and indeed, I lift and laud our God for such a gravid gift in the persona of Tremaine Solomon. I thank you, Pastor, for the privilege to share with you in this night of revival experience expression. Indeed, I am humbled and honored. I praise God for your ministry. Indeed, I praise him for your productivity. Let me just say a word to your wife. Uh, Sister Solomon, indeed, I praise the Lord for you. Uh, you are a gift, yes, to pastor, but you are a gift to the kingdom of God. And to that end, I laud and praise the Lord uh, for you. Spring Hill Church, always I'm delighted to share a word with you from the word of the Lord. Pray with me as we prepare to hear from the Lord tonight and indeed to posture and pause ourselves before the kingdom. Father, we laud you, we love you, we thank you for the novelty of this day, and indeed, we thank you for the wonder of this moment. I praise you uh, for God, the riveting reality of revival. Indeed, I relish now the gravity of your presence that you've gifted us together tonight to convene and converge virtual on this virtual platform. I say to you, thank you. Prompt me now, I pray to preach, move my mind to new cognitive expressions. I pray, God, that you'll give fluidity to my tongue. Indeed, let me speak, God, without stutter. And God, I pray in the person of the Holy Spirit, I pray for a fresh anointing that you would revivify my interior. God, speak tonight, I pray. Transcend mortal ambiguities to the end, I pray, that your voice can be heard and received in clarity. In the blessed name of Jesus the Christ, amen. Tonight, I would like to call your attention to Hebrews chapter 6. And I would like to live verses 9 through 15. That is Hebrews chapter 6. And I would like to live uh, for expression. Verses 9 through 15. Hear the word of the Lord as I lift the language from the New American Standard Version of Holy Writ. Hear the word of the Lord. Verse 9 but beloved, we are convinced of better things concerning you and things that accompany salvation, though we are speaking in this way. For God is not unjust as to forget your work and the love which you have shown toward his name in having ministered and is still ministering to the saints. And we desire that each one of you show the same diligence so as to realize the full assurance of hope until the end. So that you will not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and I will surely multiply you. And so having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be unto our God. Tonight, I want to talk to us just for a moment about the prospect of a better church, the prospect of of a better church. I want to look from the vantage point. Indeed, I want to look from the perspective 
of a preacher of long-standing presence and hence contextually in this COVID-19, in this pandemic environment, hence the environs of time, I've been beleaguered and bombarded by a myriad of questions. Uh, indeed, there have been those in voice who've raised the question, Pastor, where do we, as a church, where do we go from here? What does the future look like for the church? What do you think will be some of the changes going forward? Just a myriad of queries about the future of the church. And to be honest with you, in particularity, I have no response to the end of propriety, hence accuracy. But I can share with you in generality what I believe God perhaps wants the church to hear in this hour. And I've come to respond to the queries, perhaps maybe not thoroughly, not all of them, but nonetheless, I've come to do my best to speak to the church tonight regarding its future. Hence, I want to speak to the church concerning its development. Matter of fact, I want to say to every church, to every leader, to every pastor, that your church has potential to be better. And matter of fact, I've come to suggest to you that your church prospectively is positioned to be better. Now, having said that, these are some terrible, some would suggest, these are tough, tenuous, tumultuous times. And of course, many churches have been debilitated, exhausted. Many churches are closing their doors from a local post. And of course, the question is, what is the future for the church? So I've come to tell every church, every pastor, that you positionally are poised for a better church. It was, to be exact, 1964. It was that prophetic voice that even today resonates within the realm of possibility. Hence this planet, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who receiving his Nobel Peace Prize acceptance speech, and of course, he said these words, and I repeat them because of the seminal, perhaps, nature of his sayings. But Martin King said to an audience as he would receive his award, he said, today our survival depends upon our ability to stay awake. That's what he says, our ability to stay awake, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant and face the challenge of change. What Seminole is saying, I say again, because I believe the words are apropos even now that our survival today depends upon our ability to stay awake as a church, to adjust to new ideas, to remain vigilant, and yes, to face the challenge of change. Change challenges us. Indeed, change has a way of imposing itself upon us in the immediacy of the moment and hence many times we feel like we have been broadsided. Now, having th said that, I say to you that every church now will be bombarded with the possibilities of change. Matter of fact, to the degree, Ergen Moltmann wrote a book in 1975 and he titled the book 
the church in the power of the Holy Spirit in which he notes that every crisis means finding new barons in which he suggests that we have to literally answer the questions we've known afresh. Questions like, where do you come from? Where are you going? Who are you? Because what he reminds us is that every crisis literally causes us to question the traditional and familiar answers. And I want to talk to the church because when you look contextually, conceptually, when you look at the content of this pastoral epistle, I call it pastoral in that I believe that a preacher, hence moreover a pastor, penned as a word of warning and exaltation this epistle to the Hebrews. Hence, I believe it is a direct extension of pastoral care, caring for the congregation. Now, having said that, I want to delve into this because I believe that whether your church comes out of the pandemic bigger, it can come out better. I don't know how big you'll be, but I can suggest to you that there's good news because if you're not big, you can be better. I want you to see, perhaps if you will imaginatively, I want you to delve into this pericope that I presented in chapter 6, and I want to suggest to you two congregations. In fact, I want to lift a congregation of apostasy and a congregation of apostolicity. Now, what that suggests is that going forward, we see in the text a church that prospectively is better and a church gone bad. We see a bad church and we see a better church. I want you to see it. We see a church that's apostate and we see a church that's apostolic. Now, I hope I have not turned you off by using those two terms. Apostate means merely a deliberate Walking away from the truth of one's previous confession or profession of faith. It simply means a way with drifting, a shrinking back, a shriveling, if you will. It simply means a drifting away from the truth that one had embraced. He says, here it is. Here is a church, two churches. One bad, one better. The bad church has the same potential as the better church. You say potential. Yes. Let me read the potential that God has posited, deposited in every church organically and intrinsically. Every church has the same deposits. Let, let me read your potential. So you'll see your potential delineated in the Holy Scripture. Let, let me read it. Here was the potential perspective church, that is, church that could have been better, but chose to be bad, chose to abandon, derelict, walk away from the truth that has been revealed to them through Holy Scripture. So let, let, me, let me give you their potential. Here's what the text says, and I'm looking at verse 4 because it gives a profile of the persona of this local parish. Here it is. For, verse 4, in the case of those who have once been enlightened, here it is, they, they, they are potentially postured because they have been enlightened. They've tasted of the heavenly gift and have been partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers 
of the age to come and then they fall away. Let me tell you, how do you perish when you have so much potential? How do you regressively go back, hence backward, when progressively you have been equipped and empowered Moreover, you've been tuned and transformed for a better future. How do you perish? How do you tragically, in the spirit of a travesty, how do you end up a failure when you have potential? In fact, that great writer of years gone now, hence he's with the Lord Zig Ziglar, uh, wrote a book and he literally suggested in his book that you and I have been designed for achievement. And indeed, he says, we've been engineered for success and we have in us the seed of greatness. How does a church with so much invested perish with so much potential? I won't tell you why, because you look at the text. When you look at Hebrews, here's what you can expect to see, and I don't have time to cover it all, but you expect to see a church delivered. Hence, we've been delivered. You expect to see a church designed specifically by the divine. You see a church of deliverance, a church of design. You see a church of discernment due to development and then you see a church of destiny due to devotion now i know i've said a lot but i'm trying to cover a lot but i want you to get it that your church prospectively can be better your church doesn't have to go bad you have too much potential to go bad when you are poised postured by the holy to progressively get better. Now, having said that, some years ago, I had the experience of walking into a nursery and of course greeting uh, the little kids that were in the nursery. I shall never forget it. A young boy by the name of Zion had literally confiscated, taken all the building blocks in the, the nursery. And when I walked in, he was so enthusiastic about having literally taken all the building blocks. And he said to me, as best as he could, Pastor Kennedy, he says, I'm building. He said, look at what I'm building. I looked at what he was building. And of course, my response in query was, what is that? To which he said to me, little, little toddler said to me, he says, I don't know, but it's going to be big. Now, what he simply suggests is that everybody has an obsession with bigness. Martin King would call it an obsession with jumboism. But he says it's going to be big, but I don't know what it is. Why do you want to focus on big when you can be better. Can I tell you now, nobody is boasting, bragging about how many they have on a Sunday. Nobody is talking about, Doc, how many do your sanctuary seat? Seating capacity ceases to be now the conventional conversation for the clergy. Hear this here. Your people may not return when you reopened. Not in mass, but I've come to tell you just because the pews are empty does not mean the church cannot be better. Just because you don't have, hear me, as many in the pew as you have online does not mean your church cannot be better. Pastor, how do we get better? So let me give it to you. Let me give it to you. Here's the first thing I want to suggest to you. That if we're going to be better, he, here's what you got to understand and literally restore back into the life of the church. Here it is. Vision. We have lost vision. We've lost vision for, if you will, 
peripheral dreams, hence trappings of ego to the degree that our people have lost a sense of God. And here's what we got to give some industry to is restoring back to the sanctuary a visioned, unadulterated, a visioned, untensured, a vision of God. Our people have lost awe and wonder for God. Professor Bill, Bill wrote a book some time ago on idolatry in which he reminds us that whatever we reveal, we resemble. And so many of our churches now don't resemble God because we don't revere God. We've lost a sense of God in our churches. Hence, the God that's revealed through Jesus Christ. I want to say to every church, if you're listening to me, Restore the image of God. Restore the image of Jesus back to the congregation. Let's become once again Christ-centered. Let's become again an apostolic church. Let me tell you, according to the Hebrew writer, Jesus Christ is the apostle and high priest of our confession. Your church will either be an apostate church or an apostolic church. And until we get back to Jesus, we are, hear this, we are an apostate people. Let's get back to Jesus so that we cease to be apostate and hence we become apostolic. Hence our work revolves pivots around Jesus the Christ. Now let me tell you something. Whenever you get a glimpse in vision of Jesus, it literally draws and pigmies everybody else within the conglomeration of the congregation. Let me just tell you, nobody else becomes really that important when you push Jesus. When you honor, revere Jesus, you can literally progressively move forward. Let me tell you, when you look at Hebrews chapter 1, matter of fact, it commences with chapter 1, but chapter 1 gives us a vision. God in sundry times, that's classic King James, perhaps in many ways, as it were, spoke through the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us through his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus becomes a facsimile, a copy. Hence, intrinsically, the essence of the Father. He's the image of the Father, the representation of the Father. We have a vision. When we start Hebrews, we have a vision of who God is as revealed through Jesus Christ. I'm telling you, if the church is going to be better, she has to return. She has to restore radically the image of Jesus Christ. Let him be the hero. Let him be the savior. Let him be the Lord. Let him, hence he is the pioneer of our faith. He's the author and the finisher of such. He's the source of our salvation. Let him be your celebrity. Look up to him. I say to us, if we're going to experience better, it starts with Jesus Christ. Then a vision not only of Jesus Christ, but let me read it. Because in verse 9, but beloved, li listen, beloved, beloved, who, who are we? Because we cannot merely have a vision of Jesus, that is God revealed in Jesus, without a vision of who we are. In fact, we've got to raise some new questions out. Who are we? Henry Nouwen writes book, Life of the Beloved, in which he suggests that once we claim to be the beloved, 
then perhaps the rest of our spiritual journey is that of becoming. He says, if you claim the truth of being the beloved, now you got to become the beloved. But he says, we cannot get caught in the trap of self-rejection. I believe that the problem with the church is one of self-rejection. We've rejected our truest identity. And so whenever identity is compromised, so is integrity. And when in integrity is compromised so is intensity and when the intensity is compromised so is increase we have to make sure that we know who we are some months ago uh, I had scheduled to fly and indeed I was prepared to fly and uh, um, two days before the flight I had to cancel my flight. I had to cancel the flight because I discovered I had lost my license, hence my identity. And before I could fly, I had to find my identity. Now let me just suggest to you that I see so many churches who've lost your identity and your flight has been canceled. I want to tell you, if you're going to be better, if you're going to go higher, I understand the struggle. I understand the pressure. I understand the strain. But if you're going to go higher, you got to understand. You can't go higher. You can't fly if you have lost your identity. Go back and restore your identity. We are the household of faith. That's how we operate. We are faith holding household matter of fact we move by faith we walk by faith and not by sight we are the body of Christ and we operate in fleshing as it were the features and yes the formation of Jesus Christ because we are the beloved that, that's what he said. It, it, it's vision. It, it, it's vision. Let, let's not hold you too long. It's not only vision, but if you're going to be a better church, you must not only have vision, but there must be vulnerability. Vulnerability. That too many churches want to be better, want to do better, want to grow, want to be healthy. But, but you, you're too invulnerable. You're too impregnable for God, suggesting that you are not open to God. And I want to tell the church, if we're going to see prospectively a better church in our local areas, we must be vulnerable to God. L let me read vulnerability. Let me read it. Verse 1, he says, let, let us go on. Let us go on. Let us move on. To, there's, some much, there's much more that we need to experience as church. Matter of fact, Richard Foster wrote a book some years ago, The Celebration of Discipline, in which he suggested the desperate need of the day, and that was over 30 years ago. The desperate need of the day is not for more intelligent or gifted people, but for deep people. That's what the church needs, deep people. And you only get depth through discipleship. Here's what the text says. Let us go on to maturity. Let us leave the fundamental foundational principle. Yes, we build. They are building block, but we don't park there. Hence, progressively, we build so that we can be better. We build so that we can go higher. We build so that we can expand. We build. Here's the point. The point is the church is so given as curators to the status quo until we cannot go on to maturity. We have to give up that which is familiar. It's foundational, but it's so familiar. It is so conventional. And the church, hear me, does not want to transition and embrace it. I said transition. There's a difference between change and transition. William Bridges writes a book about transition in which he reminds us that change is situational. It's inevitable. You're going to change whether or not you want to or not because situations change us. Matter of fact, he suggests that if someone dies, that's change. But what he suggests is transition is the ability to let go of what you once knew 
so you can go on to something new. Now, that's important because there are many churches, situation has shifted. Matter of fact, William Fluker, Professor William Fluker writes a book and he titles it, The Ground Has Shifted. And if we're going to experience better, we must be vulnerable, open to God, open to change. Matter of fact, we're going to have to discern that we've been designed for discipleship and we're going to have to strategize strategically. We're going to have to create as we make disciples for mobilization. We're going to have to make disciples and then mobilize disciples. But we can't do that unless discernibly we discern our design and hence we were designed designed for discipleship designed to mimic and to imitate and emulate Jesus the Christ and walk in the spirit of obedience according to the tenets and teachings of our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ listen my time is about up but I want to tell the church we have to be vulnerable if we're going to be better got to be open to God God is subject to push us to do that which we have never done. God is subject to his Holy Spirit to guide and lead us in ways and means we've never known. God, we got to be vulnerable, open to God. It is critical, vulnerable. But hear this, hear, hear this. Not, not only must we have vision if we're going forward, we, we got to be vulnerable. But, but hear this, let me say this again and again. But you and I have to venerate what we value to the end that we are visual exposures, disclosures of that which we venerate in value. You say, what do you mean? Let me read it to you. Let me read it to you according to the text. Here's what he says. He says that they showed reverence, honored his Name. Now that's another way of saying that we have to venerate what we value. That's another way of saying that significantly you and I must live for the glory of God. I want to tell you it's not about you. It's really not about me. It's not about the parishioners. It's about God. It's about his glory. It's about his honor. And the way we bring honor to God is through our worship. It's through our witness. It's through our work. And ultimately it is through our warfare. How do we sustain significantly substantively throughout a crisis without becoming a church of apostasy? According to the scripture, we have to honor his name. Now, before I go, before I go, I, I, I got I to gotta close. We got to honor his name. We got to honor his name. We got to honor. Can I tell you why we, we got to honor his name? Let me tell you how we honor his name. We, we honor his name as we embrace the service of Christ through the power of the Holy Spirit. According to the text, they served one another. The saints served the saints. And hence, they demonstrated demonstratively without denigrating dynamic love for one another. They love one another. As they love God, they explicitly expressed it in their service to one another. I'm going when I tell you we have to serve one another. We have to show the love of God. We have to make sure that in industry we are supplying, contributing to the need of others. We don't just share the gospel. We share, yes, groceries. We don't just share the gospel. We share finances we contribute to the edification of the church we got to serve we got to serve if they're going to see God we're going to have to love we're going to have to show love we're going to have to share I'm telling you and I'm closing now but thank God for the confession of faith thank God for the profession of faith thank God for Jesus because Jesus is the high priest 
Thank God that there's none like Jesus. He's better than the angels. He's better than Moses. He's better than Aaron. He is superior. He's better. And if the church wants to be better, she has to return in repentance to God. That's where the church must return. And here, I share with you, here's what the Hebrew writer says. The Hebrew writer says, don't you be a church of indolence, indifference, or indignity. Hebrew writer says, be a church of imitators. And he says, I'm going to give you two references to imitate. I'm going to give you Abraham as a critical reference, but I'm going to give you Jesus as a cross reference. And I want to tell the church, if you want to see better days, Abraham is a critical reference because God told him he was going to bless him. He walked by faith. Jesus is a cross reference. God, through Abraham, hence moreover Jesus, promises to bless us. And he does it through the cross. Thank God for the death and atoning work of Jesus. He died on Friday. But early the third day, God raised him from the dead. And we bless God that as we go forward in the future, we have a critical reference and we have a cross reference. And climactically, we shout hallelujah. We have a brighter promising and hence we will be a better church thank you pastor solomon thank those of you who are watching tonight it's been my honor indeed it's been a glorious eventuality to share with you tonight i pray something i've said will help you but i pray that you leave this virtual reality knowing that you may not be a bigger church going forward but the prospect you can be a better church. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Praise God, saints. Give God a hand clap of praise. Give him some hearts, some likes. Oh, have not our hearts burned tonight as Pastor Kennedy stood boldly and proclaimed the gospel of Jesus Christ to us tonight. He challenged us tonight as a church on the prospect of being a better church. Spring Hill, God has been faithful to us for 181 years, and we have been moving forward by faith. And that word tonight by Pastor Kennedy was an on-time word for us. And maybe it was an on-time word for someone else that was tuning in tonight who may not be a part of the Spring Hill Nation. But I don't know about you. If you won't mind, let's take a moment and just give Pastor Kennedy a hand for blessing us tonight all the way from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, as he mounted the virtual pulpit tonight to proclaim God's word to us. I'm excited. I could barely contain myself as he preached to us tonight. I am thankful for Pastor Kennedy taking the time to be with us tonight, even if it could not be in person, but even in, virtu in a virtual land to share God's word with us. Now, if you have not had an opportunity uh, to sow at the beginning of our broadcast a gift into the Spring Hill Church, uh, you can do so at this time by giving, giving platforms are coming across the screen. You can give via Givelify, you can give via Cash App, and you can give via mail uh, and sow a seed into the Spring Hill Church. Spring Hill members, remember what you have been asked to give in support of this revival tonight. But we don't want to end a revival without extending the invitation to someone who may not have a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, without extending the invitation to someone who may be looking for a church home. The pandemic has taught us that you can be a church, you can be a member of a church from anywhere. And if you would like to connect with the Spring Hill Church, we would have, love to have you tonight. You can connect with us by texting the words SBC Lionel to the number 84576. SBC Lionel to the number 84576. And we would love to connect and engage with you on tonight. I don't know about you, but just give God another hand. My heart is full tonight. I'm so appreciative again to Pastor Ken. I'm appreciative to each and every one of you. And I'm appreciative to the Spring Hill Church for following me and having this virtual revival. Let us now close with a word of prayer. Eternal God, we say thank you tonight 
We thank you for the man of God who took time to share your word with us tonight. He poured out into us, God, and we pray tonight that you will pour back into him everything that he has shared with us tonight. We pray that you continue to bless his family, continue to bless his ministry and his life. God, we thank you for every person that tuned in tonight, every person that liked, every person that shared, every person that heart tonight. God, we pray tonight that something has been said that will help them along their faith walk. God, we thank you for the Spring Hill Church. We pray, God, that you will continue to use us to move forward by faith. To realize that after 181 years, there's still work for us to do as a church body here in the Lionville community, but also across the world. God, we thank you tonight on the prospect of being a better church. We pray that your word has fallen on good ground. That we won't just be hearers of your word, but we will be doers of your word. Thank you, God, for this time together in this sacred virtual space. Watch over us as we need this place, but never from your sight. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Beloved, I wish above all things that thou mayest prosper and be in good health, even as thy soul prosper. And if you love the Lord, say amen. In Spring Hill fashion, godly people with godly purpose cannot be defeated or denied. God bless you.